Hey there, Rednecks, Preppies, Redneck Preppies. It's me, the Redneck Preppy. How you doing today? Great. Good. Today, in the latest episode of the A Short and Convoluted History series, we're going to take a look at Germany's ill-fated Infanteriegewehr M1871-84, or Gewehr 7184, if you prefer. As always, these episodes are meant to be a brief introduction to the subject matter, not an exhaustive exploration. Now, today's subject doesn't get a lot of love from military surplus collectors, but as Germany's first repeating rifle, it represented a step forward. Now, depending on your point of view, the Gewehr 7184 paved the way for future advancements in firearms technology, or it was a bit of an evolutionary dead end. By the end of today's episode, you may find that either take is fair to some extent. That said, let's take a closer look at this rifle. This is another one of those long ladies of the 1800s, so we're gonna have to look at this Gewehr 7184 in chunks. The rifle itself is 51 inches long, or nearly 1.3 meters in length, and it comes in at a chunky 10 pounds unloaded. Definitely a rifle of its era. It fires the 11 by 60 millimeter rimmed cartridge, also known as the 11 millimeter Mauser and 43 Mauser. Now we've got a bayonet with a 10 inch blade. Gewehr 7184 bayonets are quite rare these days because many were converted to work with the Gewehr 98 rifle and original unmolested ones carry a big price tag. Now, incidentally, bayonets were not serially numbered to their rifles, so don't fall for some matching numbers hogwash if someone tries to sell your rifle with an air quotes matching numbers bayonet. Now, at front, we have an unprotected windage adjustable front barley corn sight. And right behind it, we have the lug for a bayonet to engage with. It, of course, would have had two points of contact with the barrel serving as the other point. The rifle did not come with an integrated cleaning rod, which is rather notable. Apparently, during the trials in 1882 and 1883, it was determined that one was not necessary. A bold move, but as befitting the time, it did in fact have a stacking rod, obviously more important than a cleaning rod. That stacking rod is attached to the front of the magazine tube. The 31.6 inch barrel is a right hand twist with four concentric grooves. Now you can't see it under the stock, but located underneath the barrel is the eight round tubular magazine. Fully loaded, it did tend to make the rifle fairly front heavy. Nothing amazing about the rear sight, though it is very nicely manufactured. You've got a rear leaf sight in the back with slide that features a locking push button that interacts with detents at each stop. The battle sight is zeroed at 250 meters and the smaller leaf is ranged from 350 meters all the way out to 1600 meters. And again, as befitting the time, those V-notches are very small. Now, how do you know you're looking at a Mauser rifle? Well, the flag type safety lever is usually an excellent indicator. The Gewehr 71 was in fact the first Mauser to feature it. Now the rear sling, at least on the standard model, was located in the front of the trigger guard. Incidentally, the trigger guard on the Gewehr 71 was made of brass, while for the 7184 they moved to steel. And now we get to the bolt, obviously not turned down as many rifles are. The rifles rolled out of the plant with bluing all over the rifle with the exception of the receiver and bolt. If you see anything else, that means that someone got their hands at some point on some cold blue. The rifle's action only included a bolt guide rib as its single locking lug, which locked forward of the receiving bridge. Now, this design was, remarkably, an improvement over its predecessor, the Dreyse needle gun. That said, its primary weakness is the single locking lug, and that came in for a lot of criticism at the time. In order to remove this bolt, you need to take off this bolt washer to take out and disassemble the segmented bolt. They did not make this easy to clean in the field. 
Now, as this is a Gewehr 7184, it obviously has a few features that the Gewehr 71 didn't have. Most obvious from the outside is the magazine cutoff located on the left side of the receiver. On the inside of the receiver were two pieces of additional magic. The first is the addition of an ejector where the Gewehr 71 didn't have one. If you have a repeating rifle, you absolutely need an ejector. And also in here are internal tubular magazine feeds from. With the bolt open and this lifter down, ammunition is loaded one by one into the magazine tube. Now with the cutoff open, cycling the action will of course action the elevator, pick up a round and bring it up for insertion into the chamber. Now will it surprise you to learn that the Germans put a mark on virtually everything? Yes, even back then they had a mania for it. The rifle serial number is virtually on every part from barrel bands to buttstocks. And obviously here we have the rifle's model number, IG Mod stands for, if you weren't paying attention, Infanterie Gewehr model, and the 7184 should be obvious. Now here we have the plant of manufacturer, and of course we have various proof and inspection marks. This episode marks an epic moment in this series as the predecessor of today's rifle was in fact the rifle itself. I say that tongue planted firmly in cheek as you'll soon see why. Rolling in the 1870s, the Germans, and I do realize that's a rather nebulous term to use given that the German Empire was still coming into being at this time, were using the Dreyse needle gun. Now, in case you're new to the Milserp game, the Dreyse didn't fire needles. Something that would actually scare me more than bullets. The term needle gun is based on its firing pin. That pin passed through the rear of a paper cartridge like a needle and it struck a percussion cap inside. Now, the Dreyse holds the distinction of being the first breech loading rifle to use a bolt action to open and close the chamber. Now, it was invented in 1836 and it entered service in 1841, so it was rather long in the tooth by the 1860s. Now, in the mid-1860s, the Germans started looking about for a new rifle, and that prompted a number of people to begin working on designs. Of them were gentlemen by the names of Paul and Wilhelm Mauser. In 1867, they began working on a bolt action design, and by 1871, tests were beginning to take place. Mauser's chief competitor in all of this was one Johann L. Werder of Bavaria. In 1869, that state introduced the Werder M1869. Now, using a dropping block action, the rifle fired the 11 by 50 r round, a rimmed centerfire metallic cartridge. Now, with 2,500 rifles being used during these trials, the fact that we're discussing the Gewehr 71 should spoil the ending as to who won. On December the 2nd, 1871, the rifle was provisionally adopted pending some changes that would be made, such as to the rifle's safety mechanism. A few months later, on February the 14th, 1872, the rifle was formally adopted as the Infanterie Gewehr Model 1871, or Infantry Rifle Model 1871, if you prefer English. Well, not everyone adopted it. The Bavarians really liked their Werder rifles, so they stuck with it. In a concession to logistics, however, after most German states opted for the Gewehr 71, the Bavarians rechambered their rifle to 11 by 60 millimeter rimmed to maintain ammunition compatibility. With everything settled, the Gewehr 71 began to be issued to the army, and eventually a total of 1.8 million rifles and a hundred thousand carbines rolled off the assembly lines. This was to be a rifle that lasted for many years. Well, not really. Now 
The Gewehr 71 was an economic success for the Mausers, no question about it. While Paul was baking up further design changes and staying on top of manufacturing, Wilhelm was running back and forth across Europe, selling the rifle to whomever was interested. And plenty of people were interested. Sales were made to countries across the world. Now the choices, reasonable even necessary at the time, that led to the Gewehr 71 also baked in what would be a relatively short lifespan. Now while there was no question that the Gewehr 71 was a fine rifle with excellent construction, mine is 137 years old and seems to work as well as the day it rolled off the line, it was arguably crippled from the start. German and Prussian military officers were sent to observe both the Union and Confederate armies during the American Civil War. And they sent back enough information on everything from using artillery against fortifications to cavalry tactics that would eventually be applied in future German war doctrine. They would have been aware of things like the Spencer rifle, the world's first metallic cartridge repeating rifle, and its tubular magazine. Undoubtedly conscious of the existence of the Spencer, among other repeating rifles, the Mausers nonetheless opted for a single shot rifle. Now, I believe that this may have been at the insistence of European military authorities. You know, the prevailing opinion at the time seemed to be that repeating rifles led to soldiers blasting through ammunition, and there were legitimate questions of reliability. Paul Mauser, however, didn't seem like the type to ignore innovation. They wouldn't have had any idea, however, that just over a decade from the Gewehr 71's acceptance, that black powder would be rendered an a quaint relic of a previous age. Nor would they have foreseen that the chunky ammunition of the 1870s would give way to the early versions of modern full-power rifle cartridges. These things didn't make the Gewehr 71 an ineffective combat rifle in 1872 or even 1882 for that matter. And it's easy from hindsight to sm sound smart, but the clock was ticking on the Gewehr 71. Let's take a brief break and look at the two men responsible for our subject today. I think it's fair to say that if there was a Mount Rushmore of firearms designers, Peter and Wilhelm Mauser would be locks to be on it. Peter Paul, as his name was properly, was born on June 27, 1838, and Wilhelm on May 2, 1834, in Obendorf am Neckar, then in the Kingdom of Württemberg. They were two of five brothers out of a total of 13 children. Peter being the youngest. Now, in what may have contributed to the career path that the two men would embark on, their father and all of their brothers were gunsmiths. Not surprisingly, with that number of mouths to feed, the Mausers grew up in fairly modest circumstances. Their father, Andreas Mauser, however, was a man who believed in education, and he ensured that his children received a standard education as well as learning a trade. For Peter, that meant working at a gunsmith's bench starting at age 12, alongside Wilhelm and his other brothers. Two years later, he graduated high school and joined them in the government arms factory. The factory had been established in 1811 in Ludwigsburg and Christophsthal before being moved to Obendorf. Now I'm going to reveal a bit of the end story right away. Wilhelm, although a talented gun designer himself, tend to have a brain for business. Peter, however, was the savant when it came to design. He was quickly noticed at the factory for developing new processes, tools, and equipment that allowed him to turn out parts faster than anyone else. In 1859, Peter was assigned to the Royal Wittenberg Gun Factory, also located in Obendorf, and it was about this time that he started making some plans. His father had passed away a few years earlier, two of his older brothers had become family men, while another, Franz, 
moved to the United States where he actually ended up working for Remington. Peter approached Wilhelm with the idea of creating their own rifle. And so they worked after hours working on their projects. Wilhelm, while contributing to design, took the lead in negotiating on their behalf with the factory and in later years, sales. Interesting fact, the first invention that Peter actually came up with wasn't a firearm, but a breech-loading cannon and the ammunition that it would use. Now the pair, at least according to Peter, developed the cannon while Peter came up with the ammunition. The cannon proved, unfortunately, to be a bit of a failure financially, so they decided to focus their efforts on firearms. This is one of those rare moments for me when I make the decision to gloss over some of the story because we're dealing with two men simultaneously and their history is thick with events to cover. So I'm going to move to 1871 when the German Empire accepted their Gewehr 71 into service. Now if you really want to get into the intricacies of the Mausers and their early work on rifles, which among other things involve proposed improvements to the dry sea needle gun, there are a number of good books out there which will go very deep in those weeds. The Mausers soon, thanks to a pretty sweetheart deal with the Württemberg government, went into business with their own factory in 1874, the previous Royal Württemberg Gun Factory. Now, while Wilhelm traveled across Europe selling Mauser rifles to whoever wanted them, Peter was busy with experimenting with designs and staying on top of manufacturing issues. Now, on January the 13th, 1882, tragedy struck the family as Wilhelm, who had long been sick, passed away. Peter basically took over the business and handled design, manufacture, and the books simultaneously. Now we're going to move past the Gewehr 7184 project as I'll obviously be covering that in more depth coming up. Successes aside, the arms industry wasn't all roses for Peter, however. In 1888, the Germans accepted into service the German model 1888, better known to history as the commission rifle, which Peter detested. The rifle featured a modified Mauser bolt and, what Peter disliked most about it, a Monlicker style loading clip. His greatest success would arguably be the Gewehr 98. It sprang from the lineage of the Mauser Model 1889 and it featured an updated bolt design that he had put together in 1895. That rifle ended up being used from 1898 to 1935 and was only replaced by the Car 98K, which is essentially a carbine version of the Gewehr 98. Now the only thing more explosive than his chosen field was his adopted one. Politician. Mauser served in the Reichstag from 1898 to 1903 as a member of the National Liberal Party. Paul Mauser passed away on May 29, 1914, just two months before World War I started at the age of 76. Now, if you're interested in the story of the Mauser brothers, I again strongly urge you to pick up one of the many books chronicling their story. Given the times that we live in, I'm sure you've heard the term disruptive technology. Now, if you're as old as I am, and I ain't that old, You've already seen dozens of examples of innovative technology that upended traditional or even young industries and changed how companies and consumers operate. Remember PDAs? Yeah, wasn't that long ago. Disruptive innovation is not new, nor is it limited to the high-tech field. The history of firearms is chock-full of these sorts of events, as the Germans would learn. Firearms technology would continue to move forward after the introduction of the Gewehr 71, and while single-shot rifles were serviceable, they weren't ideal. There were plenty of recent examples from conflicts, whether the aforementioned American Civil War or the Russo-Turkish War, which opened the eyes of military experts to the benefits of repeating rifles. 
And on the Mausers, both Paul and Wilhelm hadn't rested on their laurels just because they had a fat contract supplying rifles to the German Empire. They sold guns to everyone, including Serbia. Now, the Serbs, not flush with money, were keenly interested in obtaining the most modern rifles for the best price. And so the Mausers continued to refine their rifles to satisfy their and others' requests for changes and improvements. Now, it was a prototype rifle as part of that iterative process that captured the attention of Kaiser Wilhelm. It was a Gewehr 71 that had an eight-round tubular magazine, courtesy of Alfred von Kropacek, under the barrel. Now, instead of loading it from the muzzle end, as many tubular magazine-fed rifles did at the time, you could load it from the receiver while the action was open. And to placate officers who didn't think that the average grunt could be trusted with a repeating rifle, it even featured a magazine cutoff so that it could be turned back into a single-shot rifle. And to avoid rounds accidentally going off due to recoil in the magazine as the bullet rested against the primer of the round ahead of it, the bullets of the Reichs Patronin 7184 round were flattened to reduce that possibility and the primers were set in a little more deeply. Brilliant! And so the Germans ultimately accepted into service the new rifle to be known as the Infanterie Gewehr 7184. They converted Gewehr 71s and churned out 950,000 new ones. And the life the rifle would have was a smooth and long road. Well, except not. If you thought that the tubular magazine was the disruptive technology I was refer referencing earlier, you're slightly right. And we're going to return to that. The disruption was actually going to be instigated by Germany's good old friend, France. And it would revolutionize firearms going forward. About the same time that the Kaiser was smiling on the prototype Gewehr 71, the French were embarking on a plan to replace the rifles they had currently in use. The Army's single-shot 11mm Model 1874 and the Navy's Model 1878, both black powder powered. In 1886, just two years after the Germans spent a boatload of money upgrading the Gewehr 71 to the new pattern, the French introduced the Lebel Model 1886. Now that rifle, employing a svelte 8mm cartridge, was the first to use smokeless powder developed in 1884 by Paul-Marie-Eugène Vaillel and basically rendered everything else in use obsolescent or worse. Smokeless powder, of course, brought some big advantages with it. It's obviously a cleaner system that's far less to prone to fouling up a rifle. The higher velocities would mean a straighter trajectory. The French smokeless powder was also three times more powerful than black powder at the same weight. Now, of course, the French kind of fumbled the introduction of their new rifle, but no one in the military world was disabused as to what this new technology meant. The introduction of the nitrocellulose-based smokeless powder that the French dubbed Poudre B immediately instigated an international race amongst the great powers to have their own version. Of course, secrets don't last long, and by 1888, Germany had a modified version of the French powder for use. Related to the introduction of smokeless powder, of course, was the round that the Gewehr 7184 utilized. The Paul Mauser developed 11 by 60 millimeter rimmed cartridge. Now, depending on which source you looked at, it used a 370 to 390 grain bullet, traveling anywhere from 1,300 to 1,400 feet per second. By comparison, the 8mm Lebel used a 198 grain bullet, traveling 2,400 feet per second. Flatter trajectory, a lighter round, and ostensibly more lethal. And the magazine was also a bit of an issue. The M1886 Lebel 
also used a tube magazine, but people had already been exploring utilizing box magazines, both internal and detachable, for a few years at that point. Now granted, it wasn't until 1888 that the Lee Metford appeared with the first mass-produced box magazine equipped rifle. But that doesn't erase the fact that the technology could have been available to the Mausers. So by 1886, less than two years after the Gewehr 7184 had been rolling off production lines at Mauser's plant, the Germans were already casting about for its replacement. In 1888, the Germans introduced the new Patron 88 cartridge, the first iteration of what we know as the 8mm Mauser, and the rifle to use it, the Gewehr 88 better known as the Model 1888 Commission Rifle. Now, the Commission Gewehr was a bit of a dog's lunch of features. It had the Gewehr 71's receiver and bolt, a magazine by Manlecker, barrel and rifling courtesy of Francis LaBelle, among other ingredients. Ultimately, though not many people had love for it, but that story is another episode. As for the Gewehr 71 and 7184, well, it didn't disappear from German service for several decades. Now, while it never actually saw frontline service with the Germans, unless you want to argue that German participation in the Boxer Rebellion qualifies, the rifles were carried by the German Navy and reserve forces behind the lines in World War I. Some had been rechambered in various calibers, such as 7.65 by 53mm Mauser. They also saw some service with other countries to varying degrees, notably South America's 1897 Uruguayan Revolution, Africa's Second Boro War, and Asia's 1894 Sino-Japanese War. About 27,000 German Gewehr 7184s retired from service made their way to Venezuela, while another 10,000 went to Ecuador. There were two primary variants of the Guerrero 71, one designed for Jaeger units and the other for the cavalry. For the former, the big change was essentially moving the rear sling swivel, usually found in front of the trigger guard to the buttstock, while the cavalry version was obviously a shortened version of the rifle. Now, contrary to what you might be expecting, the Germans didn't actually put out a carbine version of the Gewehr 7184. But the only change ever made to the rifle to accommodate specialized soldiers was a modification made for Jaeger units, which, like the Gewehr 71, involved moving the lower sling swivel to the buttstock. Now, if you ever come across a cavalry carbine Gewehr 7184, you're looking at the handiwork of Bubba. Now, while the Germans didn't go down this path, the Serbs actually did. They released two rifles, the M1884 Mauser Koka Cavalry Carbine and the M1884 Mauser Artillery Short Rifle, both based on the Gewehr 71. Now, if you ever cross, come across one of them, you'll know they're the real deal if they're chambered in the preferred Serbian cartridge at the time, 10.15 by 63 millimeter rimmed. Outside of Germany, as I stated earlier, there are a number of users of the Gewehr 71 and 7184. Now, Mauser rifles have long been popular in South America, so it shouldn't be a surprise that a number of countries there accepted into service those rifles. Among those employing the Gewehr 71 were Argentina, Colombia, Uruguay, and Honduras. Other parts of the world, we had China, Serbia, Thailand, and the Irish Republic. The list of users for the Gewehr 7184 was perhaps not surprisingly somewhat shorter. Venezuela, Ecuador, and Thailand were notables, as well as Canada. Well, the Quebec Home Guard specifically. If you ever come across a 7184 marked with QHG, you have yourself a very rare duck. While doing research for this episode, I stumbled across one quote that made me laugh. And it went, the Gewehr 71s, 
greatest use was probably to be used as a prop in posed pictures of soldiers. It's a little harsh. But the Gewehr 71 and 7184's greatest legacy, at least outside of photography, may have been to serve as one of those examples of ill-timed technologies that had it not been for one or two unforeseen events, would have likely adequately served for some time. Kind of like that PDA I showed you earlier before the smartphone arrived. The Gewehr 7184 was a nexus of several features which would disappear from many military rifles in fairly short order. A slow fat round, a tubular magazine, black powder. It was, to be polite, mostly a dead end. Now all of that, however, would be remedied in future Mauser rifles, and you could argue that the core elements of what would eventually be known as the Mauser Action was baked into the Gewehr 71 and 7184. I think that the rifle's greatest legacy wasn't service in war or as a paradigm shifter, but rather serving as the launching board for Peter and Wilhelm Mauser. Let's not forget that the Gewehr 7184 was probably the best option for a next generation rifle made in Germany. And thanks to that rifle being accepted by the Germans, among other countries around the world, it gave the brothers a foothold into arms manufacturing that would last decades. So I don't refer to the 71 and 7184's failures. Perhaps more accurately, iterative steps that would end up with giants like the Gewehr 98 and Car 98K and homework copiers like uh, America's M1903 Springfield, the Japanese Arasaka, the Yugoslav M48 and M59, uh, Argentina's F-Map, among others. Not exactly a bad legacy. At any rate, I hope you found today's video to at least be vaguely entertaining and mildly informative. As always, I hope you have yourself a fantastic day. Take care, and bye-bye.